guys. Um, so when we left off, we had just seen um, Tara walk off the platform at the train station and walk in front of a train. So we're going to read the chapter right now called In Loving Memory of Tara Burgess. Um, this takes place in Glasgow, which I'm pretty sure that is in Scotland, which is where the Burgess sisters are from. So that's why her um, funeral is taking place there in Glasgow. And then we're also going to read the little passage that goes along with the labyrinth chapter. OK, so here we go. The funeral is a quiet one, despite the number of mourners present. There are no sobs or flailing handkerchiefs. There is a smattering of color amongst the sea of traditional black. Even the light rain cannot push it down into the realms of despair. It rests instead in a space of thoughtful melancholy. Okay, so if you're paying attention to some of those descriptions, more or less saying that the kind of like the tone of the funeral is sad, but it's not like drowning in grief. There are people wearing bright colors. Um, a lot of people are there kind of like to celebrate her life, um, perhaps because it does not feel as though Tara Burgess is entirely gone when her sister sits alive and well, one half of the pair still breathing and vibrant. And at the same time, something looks strikingly wrong to everyone who lays eyes on the surviving uh, sister, something they can't quite put their finger on, something out of balance. Okay, so one theory is that the funeral doesn't seem as sad because uh, Lainey is still there and Lainey looks so much like Tara that it doesn't feel like Tara's all the way gone. But also that Lainey looks strange uh, being on her own without her sister Tara by her side. An occasional tear rolls down Lainey Burgess's cheek, but she greets each mourner with a smile and thanks them for attending. She makes jokes that Tara might have quipped were she not inside the polished wood coffin. There are no other family members present, though some less familiar acquaintances assume that the white-haired woman and her bespectacled man who seldom leave Lainey's side are her mother and husband, respectively. While they are incorrect, neither Madame Podva nor Mr. Barris mind the mistake. Okay, so there's no other family there, which maybe suggests that they don't even have any other family. But uh, Mr. Barris and Madame Podva are walking on either side of Lainey and kind of like staying with her. Um, and people assume that Mr. Barris is her husband and that Madame Podva is maybe um, her mother. Okay, so that's kind of what this situation is looking like. There are countless roses, red roses, white roses, pink roses. There is even a single black rose amongst the blossoms, though no one knows its origin. Shandrash takes credit only for the white blooms, keeping one pin to his lapel that he toys with distractedly throughout the service. Okay, so you can think about it and see who you think the one black rose is from. When Lainey speaks about her sister, her words are met with sighs and laughter and sad smiles. I do not mourn the loss of my sister because she will always be with me in my heart, she says. I am, however, rather annoyed that my Tara has left me to suffer you lot alone. I do not see well without her. I do not hear as well without her. I do not feel as well without her. I would be better off without a hand or a leg than without my sister. Then at least she would be here to mock my appearance and claim to be the pretty one for a change. We have all lost our Tara, but I have lost a part of myself as well. In the cemetery, there's a single performer that even some of the mourners who are not part of Le Cirque de Rev recognize, though the woman bedecked from head to toe in snowiest white has added a pair of feathered wings to her costume. They cascade down her back and flutter gently in the breeze while she remains still as stone. Many of the attendants seem surprised by her presence, but they take their cues from Lainey, who is delighted at the sight of the living angel standing over her sister's grave. Okay, so um, one of the times that we saw Bailey uh, visiting the circus, he saw this attraction and it was a statue that was like barely moving and nobody really knew who um, it was. 
um, like who it was in memory of, and now we can see that it's in memory of Tara Burgess. So um, they now have added wings to her, and she, from now on, she's going to be called, what did they call it? Um, the Living Angel. Okay. It was the Burgess sisters, after all, who originated the tradition of such statues within the circus. Performers standing stock still with elaborate costumes and painted skin on platforms set up in precarious spaces between tents. If watched for hours, they sometimes change position entirely, but the motion will be agonizingly slow to the point that many observers insist they are cleverly crafted automatons and not proper people. The circus contains several of these performers. The star-speckled empress of the night, the cold, dark, black pirate, the one that now watches over Ter Tara Burgess is most often referred to as the Snow Queen. There is the softest of sobbing as the coffin is lowered into the ground, but it is difficult to pinpoint who it is coming from or if it is instead a collective sound of mingled sighs and wind and shifting feet. The rain increases and umbrellas sprout like mushrooms amongst the graves. The damp dirt turns quickly to mud and the remainder of the burial is hastened to accommodate the weather. The ceremony fades out rather than ending properly, the mourners shifting from neat robes to mingling crowd without a distinct moment to mark the change. Many linger to pass additional condolences on to Laney, though some move off to seek shelter from the rain before the last of the dirt has settled. Okay, so it starts to rain. They um, quicken up the tempo of the funeral to get it over uh, so that nobody's standing in the rain. Some people hang back, but most people take off at that point. We are gonna see a kind of interesting conversation between some of the characters we know though, as they stick around to kind of linger. Um, let's see. Isabel and Sukiko stand side by side some distance from Tara's grave, sharing a large black umbrella that Isabel holds over their heads in one black gloved hand. Sukiko insists she does not mind the rain, but Isabel shelters her anyway, grateful for the company. Okay, so Sukiko and uh, Isabel are gonna have a conversation. How did she die? What do you think of all of this? How did she die, Sukiko asks. It is a question that others have asked in hushed whispers throughout the afternoon and has been met with various answers, few of them satisfying. Those who know the details are not forthcoming. I was told it was an accident, Isabel says quietly. She was hit by a train. Sukiko nods thoughtfully, pulling a, a silver cigarette holder and matching lighter from the pocket of her coat. How did she really die, she asks. What do you mean, Isabel says, looking around to see if anyone is close enough to overhear their conversation, but most of the mourners have dissipated into the rain. Only a handful remain, including Celia Bowen with Poppet Murray clinging to her gown, the girl wearing a frown that seems more angry than sad. Laney and Mr. Bear stand next to Tara's grave, the angel hovering over them close enough to lay its hands upon their heads. You have seen things that defy belief, have you not? Sukiko adds, asks. Isabel nods. Do you think perhaps those things would be more difficult to reconcile if you were not part of them yourself? Perhaps to the point of driving one mad? The mind is a sensitive thing. I don't think she stepped in front of the train on purpose, Isabel says, trying to keep her voice as low as possible. Perhaps not, Sukiko says. I contend it is a possibility at the very least. She lights her cigarette, the flame catching easily despite the dampness of the air. Okay, so Sukiko makes the comment that she feels like um, you could start to get, uh, you could start to get a little crazy if you were part of this, like if you were part of the circus, but you didn't know all the details of it, it might drive you mad. Uh, Isabel says, yeah, but I don't think she did it on purpose. She didn't step in front of the train to commit suicide. I don't think that's possible. Sukiko says, maybe that's not what happened, but I want to put it out there that it is a possibility. It could have been an accident, Isabel says. Have you had any accidents recently? Any broken bones, burns, any injury at all, Sukiko asks. 
No, Isabel says. Have you taken ill, even the slightest of sniffles? No. Isabel racks her brain for the last time she felt under the weather, and she can only come up with a head cold she had a decade ago, the winter when she, before she met Marco. I do not believe any of us have since the circus started, Tsukiko says, and no one has died until now. No one has been born either, not since the Murray twins, though it is not for lack of trying given the way some of the acrobats carry on. I, Isabel starts but cannot finish. It is too much for her to wrap her mind around and she is not sure she wants to be able to understand it. We are fish in a bowl, dear, Tsukiko tells her, cigarette holder dangling precariously from her lips. Very carefully monitored fish, watched from all angles. If one of us floats to the top, it was not accidental. And if it was an accident, I worry that the watchers are not as careful as they should be. Okay, Tsukiko seems to have like the feel of the circus figured out. She might not have the right words for it, but she points out to Isabel that no one's really gotten sick since the circus has started. Nobody's died. There haven't been any accidents or injuries, and definitely no one's died up until this point. And Tsukiko makes the comparison that they are fish in a fishbowl being monitored very closely. And that's kind of like what she calls it. Isabel stays silent. She wishes Marco had accompanied Shandresh, though she doubts he would answer any of her questions if he consented to speaking to her at all. Every reading she has done privately on the matter has been complicated, but there is always the presence of strong emotion on his part. She knows he cares about the circus. She has never had any reason to doubt that. Have you ever read your cards for someone who could not understand what they were dealing with? even though to you it was clear from only a short conversation and pictures on paper, Tsukiko asks. Yes, Isabel says. She has seen them hundreds of times. The quarants who could not see things for what they were, blind to betrayals and heartbreak and always stubborn no matter how gently she tried to explain. It is difficult to see a situation for what it is when you are in the midst of it, Tsukiko says. It is too familiar, too comfortable. Tsukiko pauses. The curls of smoke from her cigarette slide between the raindrops as they wind around her head and up into the damp air. Perhaps the late Miss Burgess was close enough to the edge that she could see it differently, she says. Isabel frowns, looking back toward Tara's grave. Laney and Mr. Barris have turned and are walking away slowly, his arm around her shoulders. Have you ever been in love, Kiko? Isabel asks. Tsukiko's shoulders stiffen as she exhales slowly. For a moment, Isabel thinks her question will go unanswered, but then she replies, <clears throat> I've had affairs that lasted decades and others that lasted hours. I have loved princesses and peasants, and I suppose they loved me each in their way. This is a typical Tsukiko response. Once that one that does not truly answer the question, Isabel does not pry. Listen to what Tsukiko says next. It will come apart, Tsukiko says after a long while. Isabel does not need to ask what she means. The cracks are beginning to show. Sooner or later, it is bound to break. She pauses to take a final drag off her cigarette. Are you still tempering? Yes, Isabel says, but I don't think it's helping. It is difficult to discern the effect of such things, you know. Your perspective is from the inside, after all. The smallest charms can be the most effective. It doesn't seem to be very effective. Perhaps it is controlling the chaos within more than the chaos without. Isabel does not reply. Tsukiko shrugs and says no more. After a moment, they turn to leave together without discussion. The Snow White Angel alone remains hovering over Tara Burgess's fresh grave, holding a single black rose in one hand. She does not move, does not even bat an eyelash. Her powdered face stays frozen in sorrow. The increasing rain pulls stray feathers from her wings and pins them to the mud below, 
Okay, a couple things that maybe you caught, maybe you didn't. Uh, go back and reread Sukiko's response to Has she ever been in love? Um, there's a little uh, clue in there as to um, Sukiko's sexual orientation, which uh, w it actually will matter later in the play that you realize that. So that's why I'm pointing it out right now. Um, also, Isabel very, I'm sorry, Sukiko very strongly believes that the circus is already starting to fall apart and that it's going to fall apart in a big way coming soon. She also asked Isabel, Isabel, are you still tempering? Okay, we haven't really talked about what tempering means, um, but remember that Marco did try to teach Isabel a little bit about magic when they were still living in his flat. Um, so uh, Isabel is doing her own kind of like form of magic to kind of like keep the chaos in order in the circus, but she says, yes, I'm still doing it. I just don't feel like it's very effective. Okay, so that, that is that chapter. We're going to read the little, you know, like we talked about in class, how, you know, all the uh, chapters that have the squiggly lines around it are us experiencing the circus as if we were a circus goer. Okay, so this is called the labyrinth. This is the part from the collaborations chapter that uh, was like a whole series of rooms. One of the rooms had books hanging from the ceiling. One of the rooms was full of snow. One of the rooms was full of sand, right? Okay, this is the labyrinth. It's actually like a big building or tent that Marco will add a room to, and then Celia will add a room to, and then Marco will add a room. Okay, so if we were going to the circus, this is what we would experience in that particular tent. Labyrinth. You walk down a hallway papered in playing cards, row upon row of clubs and spades. Lanterns fashioned from additional cards hang above, swinging gently as you pass by. A door at the end of the hall leads to a spiraling iron staircase. The stairs go both up and down. You go up, finding a trapdoor in the ceiling. The room it opens into is full of feathers that flutter downward. When you walk through them, they fall like snow over the door in the floor, obscuring it from sight. There are six identical doors. You choose one at random, trailing a few feathers with you. The scent of pine is overwhelming as you enter the next room to find yourself in a forest full of evergreen trees. Although these trees are not green, but bright and white, luminous in the darkness surrounding them, they are difficult to navigate. As soon as you begin walking, the walls are lost in shadows and branches. There is a sound like a woman laughing nearby, or perhaps it is only the rustling of the trees as you push your way forward, searching for the next door, the next room. You feel the warmth of breath on your neck, but when you turn, there is no one there. Okay, so the labyrinth kind of reminds me of that ride that they used to have at California Adventure called Soaring Over California. And like in one part, you would soar over a grove full of orange trees and you could actually like smell the oranges or you know like you're over the waterfalls and you could hear the the water rustling in your ears that's kind of like how the labyrinth is like you walk into one room and it's a totally different feeling you might have different scents you might have like a change in temperature you might be able to feel wind on your skin and things like that okay so um that's like the best comparison i can think of to compare the labyrinth was something you guys might already be familiar with.